This is the introductory lecture for Public Health Studies capstone class. Now it's fall 2017. We're talking about concepts for creating better. Not just less bad, but really better. And I like to call it getting to plus three, which you'll understand in a couple minutes. Now if we look at the health status of America and wonder how we're doing, look at the surveys, and if we think about how with such a rich country, how we're actually doing, I have to say, we're really doing pretty poor. I mean, we could be so much better. The opportunity is that, you know, whenever something goes wrong, we'd say we could start over, just hit, hit that little button and restart. And we can do that if we switch how we approach health promotion and how we do that. There is, I think, a better way for us to go about health and we can get better results. Because right now, if you look at America, I mean, our rankings are, unfortunately, not very good. So, Health is a very needed profession. We need people to enjoy a higher quality of life so they can get more out of their lives. If you look at the past, I mean, we really, since I've been young, we've done the same thing for years and years and years. And it's how do we create healthy lifestyle habits? And just looking at the past data, we can see with all we've done, we've gotten fatter, we're less active, smoking's done well because we've really changed the environment and the culture about smoking. But we're eating less vegetables, drinking more alcohol, and adhering less to behaviors. So, you know, the money we spent on all the effort we have to build the healthy lifestyle hasn't had the results that we had hoped for. Now, this is just something a little different. My daughter sent this to me when she was in Sweden. It has no theoretical basis. I can't do any science, but it, it, it seems to represent a good story. I mean, look at this picture of the man from 1903, who was the largest man at that time. And then... I can look at the picture of a police officer, which I think many of us can recognize. And to me, that's enough said. And we must do better. You know, just like this shows, there might be another way to do this. Maybe we don't have to just go after the bad to get rid of it. For example. So, I learned a new trick yesterday, yesterday, and it really, really blew, blew my mind. My mind. Because, because I've been, I've been eating, eating bananas, bananas forever, forever, and I would and always, always try to try open it from the stem, stem like, like dig my finger, my finger in, in make, make, bite, bite it, it, get that get nice, that nice taste, taste of banana, banana in your mouth. mouth. But then, but then um, um, uh, a friend, a friend of, mine, of mine, Brittany, saw me, saw me like, like struggling, struggling with it with yesterday, and showed me how, how monkeys, monkeys open a banana, and you don't open it from the stem. Just kind just of kind pinch, 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 pinch the, the tip, tip. It'll, it'll split, split. and you peel and you it out like, it like that. My whole My adult, adult life, life, I never, I never knew, knew the right, the right way, way to open, open a banana. banana. And now, now you do too. Interesting, isn't it? I'm not saying that's the right way to open a banana, but there is another way to do things, and sometimes it may be more effective. Now, interestingly, we, you know, why do people want health? And I think really people want health because it enables them to have the life they want. It enables them to live and do what they can in their life, which may be problematic if they don't have it. And traditionally, the way we approach health to give people health has always been <coughs> prevention, which really doesn't make any sense. How would we prevent something to cause something? I mean, we really have to make things happen. Let's do it. Let's do a little thought experiment. Suppose that... um. Everybody knows what happened in 9-11-2001 with, um, with the plane crash. But suppose like in the 1990s, there was a senator, maybe Wilbur Roy Wartwright, and he um, thought, you know what, there could be some day where someone takes over a plane and flies it into a building, uses it like a missile. And of course, everybody thought he was crazy. But just imagine... He got enough support from fellow senators, and he was able to convince the airlines who you know, were complaining about how much they already had cost constraints. There was no way they could actually build armor-proofed or proof the cockpit so nobody could get in but the actual pilots or anybody that was registered. You know, how could they have done that? But sure enough, he was able to convince the airlines. He was able to get enough senator support, and they got a change. And by September 10th, 2001... Every single airline had lock-proof doors in their cockpit so nobody could get in the cockpit except those that were authorized, the pilots. Well, imagine if that happened. 
Just imagine, if that did happen, September September 11th never would have happened. We never would have had the tragedy that occurred at the World Trade Center. And nobody would have known. There wouldn't have been praise for Wilbur for having done that because nobody would have known that nothing happened. That we didn't have a terrible tragedy, that there wasn't, the terrorists didn't, didn't succeed. We never would have known. Because you see, if prevention works. <laughs> nothing happens. Yay! I mean, yeah, that's good. That's a great thing to happen. But most people want something for it. Like these med meditators, nothing happens next. This is it. Now, truly, I want you to understand, this is really about you. I want you guys, I want everybody to be phenomenally successful. Why? Why would I want you to be successful? Because if you're successful, you know, I'm really selfish. And I want you to be selfish. Because that's how we're going to create a better world. For everyone. I know many of you are thinking, what in the world is he talking about? What does that mean? Well, think about it. The overall aim is to improve. We want to get better. How are we going to get better? By what method? I'm suggesting we could be selfish. But then I had some questions. I read this comic. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there were no hatred? Wouldn't it be wonderful if there were no hatred in the whole world? Why does this interest you so much, Charlie Brown? That nobody would hate me. Got me questioning the idea of selfish, because that doesn't really make a better world. It just makes it so that nobody hates Charlie Brown. And then I saw this baby blues and it said, So how's school so far? Great, we have this new girl in our class, and all the mean girls are picking on her. Well, how does that make it great, Zoe? Well, now they're not picking on me. Well, as a, you know, it says a lecture coming on, it doesn't make the world any better. It just kind of moved the meanness. It doesn't make it a better world. And selfish is lacking consideration for others. And that, it just, that wouldn't work. So how am I going to create a better world? And that's going to have to be to enable people to achieve their potential. Let everybody do the best they possibly can do. So I thought, wow, maybe I'm just being selfless. But selfless is concerned more with the needs and wishes of others than one's own. Or being unselfish. And that wasn't right, because I wanted a better world for myself. I wasn't being unselfish. I wanted a better world. Yeah, and then I heard this. But my first, my first question, question for, you is, for you is, why, why help, help other, other people? people? What's, in it, for What's you? in it for you? I want to I leave, want to leave my, daughter my daughter and the grandchildren, and grandchildren I hope to have and all these young people, people a better world. And I think, and I think the reason the you reason should do things for other people, people at bottom, at bottom is selfless. Is selfless. selfless. There's, no There's no real difference between selfish and selfless if you understand how the world works. We're all tied together. There's no difference between selfish and selfless? Not if you understand how the world works. We live in an independent world. Suppose you're in America and you're worried about growth in the American economy. So we're 4% of the world's population. We've got about 20% of its income. We've got to sell something to somebody else. The more you reduce poverty overseas, the more you increase education and improve health care and empower women and girls, the more you will have growth overseas, the more there will be global growth, the better off Americans will be. If every time you cut off somebody else's opportunities, you shrink your own horizons. So wow, selfish and selfless are the same thing. So that really was what I was after. So maybe, was it synergy? But then I saw synergy was the outcome that produces a greater effect than the sum of separate parts. But there are no separate parts. Everything's connected. We all, everything affects everything. Because so whenever we do something, we create an interaction. Therefore, everything we do is an interaction. And Einstein told us, a hundred times every day, I remind myself my inner and outer life are based on the labors of others. Only a life lived for others is one that's worthwhile. And Emerson said, It's one of the most beautiful compensations of life that no man can sincerely try to help another without helping himself. So kind of back to that selfish thing. You're helping someone else, you're really helping yourself. So it's a selfish deed. And I know the quality of my life depends on the labors of others. The better others do, the greater potential I have for a better life. So I needed a word that describes selfish, selfless synergy. Well, I thought maybe we could do this. Selfergy. But then I thought about it. That really wouldn't work because it's just an individual. That's about self. I want organizations to think, like Elon Musk is thinking, um, how do we create an organization that 
improves the world, helps other people, and also turns a profit. I know Toyota's talking about how they can develop cars that actually clean the air, which would help the world, allow them to turn a profit, and make people feel good. So we want organizations to think this way. So maybe we could have orgery. And then when I said it out loud and talking with some people, I said, eh, that word might not work. I mean, I know you get a warm feeling when you think about it, but it just, there might be a problem. So I talked with the linguist, Steve Cerruti, and he said, really what you're thinking about is this, pangenesis, which is literally creating all good. Pan is all, you is good or well, and genesis is creating. So it's creating all, all good, which I define as actions by individuals, groups, or organizations that create the best outcomes for all parties with a byproduct of pervasive reciprocal positive benefits. <sighs> That's a lot. But the comics explain it pretty well. Blondie and Dagwood are talking, and she wants to know if he'll help him. If she'll help, if he'll help her, or she has to delay making dinner. Well, he helps her, and she's able to make dinner. So then they feel good about each other. And we know from Dan Early's work that the emotional state you are going into an interaction pretty much determines how that interaction goes. And if they helped each other, they're gonna have a real positive, positive feeling, positive emotions. And when the kids come to dinner, every, it, it leads to better outcomes. It's a good ripple effect that will move through the system. So we're trying to generate comprehensive benefits by creating interactions so everyone and everything benefits and the ripple that creates, both the short and the long term. So it's really about creating better relationships. Better relationships not just with each other, but with the environment, with your city, with your community, with your significant, whoever it is. It's creating relationships with everything and everyone that's near you. This is really an application of Deming Systems Appreciation. And that's how we can operationalize pandigenesis. You know, I want a better world, and I practice pandigenesis in the belief that will make it better, and I think we all can do this. Well, how? Well, we need an overarching framework, and of course we need the big picture, and we need the little details, how this fits together. So just to make sure, you know, how does this work? How is this going to fit together? Well, you know what? <laughs> this has been done. Famously, Dr. William Edwards Deming, who passed away in 1993, who did quality management. He's the one who's famous that brought the Japanese from making what were unusable products to some of the highest quality products in the world. And now it's worldwide. Deming methods are what drives the quality movement. If you want to learn more about Deming, you can go to the Deming Institute, which I have linked here. And they have conferences yearly. I've presented at a few in New York. It's just, it's a, great, just, just a great way to do things. Now, his guiding principles was what he calls profound knowledge. And the guiding principle first is systems appreciation. Systems appreciation is that everything, everything is this one system. And we're part of the system. The, scene, the system doesn't, isn't here for us. We are, have to serve the system because if we do something to benefit the system, it benefits us, benefits the world. That's a way to practice pandigenesis. Now, along with system appreciation, there's also understanding of variance. So we understand how to react. He was talking about where, why is it turning out different? Is it turning out different because of an external cause? Maybe some changes in the environment, some changes in the weather. Is it an outside cause? Is it a change in rules, regulations? What caused the change? Or was it because of the way the process we used? So is the variance common or was it special? And that would teach us how to react. And the theory of knowledge, he's talking about not what we know, but how we create new knowledge that will lead us to better outcomes. And psychology, understanding how psychology, how do we motivate people, how do we excite people, how do we hit people's hot buttons, help them get involved. And how can we drive continuous and never-ending improvement? Continuous improvement is vital because progress, principle, and adaptation. Basically, we are happiest and feel best when we feel like we're making progress towards an internally generated goal. We move towards what we want. Because really, wherever we are, whatever happens to us, from winning the lottery to becoming a quadriplegic, we're going to adapt. And we're going to discover how it is. The research shows that while it has a dramatic effect initially when these things happen, either winning the lottery or becoming a quadriplegic, within a year, we develop new abilities or new skills or lose some things and realize our happiness goes back to the level it was. So it's really about how do we keep making progress so we can have higher and higher levels of quality of life. So this is what I'm proposing is adapting this business model for health. But it's really because Deming's model isn't traditional. 
It's not about how to cut costs, but it's how to move to a positive. He focused on quality. For health, we're talking about health gains. And one of the side effects of his higher quality was decreased costs. Higher quality wasn't about more cost. It actually lowered costs and benefited everyone and everything. So in health, of course, we're talking about less problems as we improve our gains and improve our resilience. So focus was how do we continually improve the process? Not focusing on outcomes, but how do we make the process better and better so the process can take care of itself, which gives us a great guide, guide to follow and a model. The thing that we need with this, with these principles, because it, it, it's kind of on a tenuous boundary there, so we need leadership. We have to lead these, these ideas and live these ideas to show that they create better, a better life for everyone. Now, one of the ways this was done and shown how we can use these ideas of profound knowledge was the Kano model. Noriaki Okano, professor, um, adapted this model. I want to share with you some of his thoughts about how we can do this, as was explained in this video. Is customer the most important word used in your business vocabulary? Are you consistently differentiating your product or service from the competition? How important is innovation for the long-term success of your company? And what are you doing about it? Discovering, Discovering the Kano model, model, a critical, critical first, step first step to understanding your customer, customer needs better, better than they understand, than they understand their, own their own needs. Few will, Few will argue the following, the following three, points. three points. Value, Value attracts, attracts customers. customers. Quality, Quality earns, earns respect. respect. And, and innovation, innovation differentiates, differentiates you from the competition. From the competition. Many feel Many that feel value, quality, quality, and innovation are three mutually exclusive, exclusive goals. goals. And the fact, and the is, fact that is that successful companies, companies and products consistently deliver on all three. All three. The key to the, the key success, success is unlocking, unlocking the customer, customer code, code, which is much is easier said, said than said done. done. Research, Research has, proved has proved that the decisions, that the decisions customers, customers make when buying when products and service work at a conscious and subconscious level. What this means to us is that we must understand the customer's needs better than the customers can articulate their own needs. The point is simple here. Unlike conventional thinking in many companies, customers are only able to give you part of the formula for success. And if this is true, the question is how can we gather all the necessary inputs and information to consistently design winning products and services that deliver value, quality, and innovation? Part of the answer lies in a model developed by Japan's Professor Noriaki Kano in the 1980s. His model, His model describes three types, types of customer, customer needs, needs that occur, that occur on, a on a conscious and subconscious, and subconscious level. level. If we miss any of these, we'll likely, likely end up with a lukewarm offering, offering, offering that's not very competitive, very competitive or, profitable. or profitable. The model the starts with a set of axes where three, three types, types of needs will be plotted. plotted. The vertical, the vertical axis, axis is satisfaction, satisfaction level. level. From very From satisfied, satisfied on top to neutral in the middle to very dissatisfied on the bottom. The horizontal axis objectively describes how well each of these needs has been executed or fulfilled. All the way to All the, the way right, to the, the right, need, the was, need executed was executed very well. well. All the way to all the, the way left, to the left, executed very poorly, very poorly or, not or not at all. The first, the first of the three types of needs, of needs are called performance needs. Performance needs, performance needs can both satisfy your customer, customer and dissatisfy them, depending on how well they're executed. Well they're executed. These, These needs are at the top, top of your customer's mind and consciously evaluated when deciding which product or service to buy. Customers will typically speak about these when asked what's important. A product example might be fuel economy on a car. If a, if a vehicle gets 12, gets 12 miles, miles per gallon, gallon you'd likely, you'd be, in likely be in the lower left portion, portion of this model. Of this model. 24, 24 miles, miles per gallon, gallon in the middle. In the middle. And, 65 and 65 in the upper, in the right, upper right hand portion. portion. A, service a service example is, is let's say check-in check time, time at a hotel. At a hotel. If, the hotel. if the hotel takes 10, 10 minutes to check, to check in, in, you'd likely be in the lower left hand portion. Three minutes, somewhere in the middle. And 20 seconds in the upper right hand portion, very satisfied. The second the type second of needs type are called needs basic, are basic needs. needs. Their presence, Their presence does, not does not directly add to satisfaction, satisfaction but, their but their absence will result in extreme dissatisfaction. These are the These needs, are the that, needs customers that customers typically don't give much thought to unless, unless they're, violated. they're violated. They're the givens, the, givens, the, items, the that items that are expected, are expected and taken, and taken for, granted. for granted. A product, a product example might be a car door's ability to miss the curb when parked next to it. If we hit the curb when opening the door, customers will obviously be quite upset. 
If the door, if the door easily, easily clears, clears the, curb, the curb, it's business, it's business, as, business usual. as usual. Customers, Customers are, just are just neutral. neutral. A, service a service example, example might, might be providing, be providing toilet, toilet paper in a paper hotel, in hotel room. room. No, toilet no toilet paper? paper? The, front the front desk is front definitely, definitely going to hear about it. About it. If you provide, if you provide three, three extra rolls, your guests your probably guests aren't going to be bragging, bragging to their friends. Their, friends. Their, satisfaction their satisfaction just remains, remains neutral. neutral. The third, the third type, type of need are called excitement needs. needs. These are the These wows, are the, wows the, innovations the innovations that differentiate you from the competition, from the competition and often yield higher margins. Higher margins. They, delight they delight the customer, the customer when, delivered, when delivered, but don't, but don't cause dissatisfaction when missing. Some companies call these USPs or UVPs, unique selling or value propositions which play a which critical, play a critical role, role in the success of most profitable products and services because they're because closely they're linked with emotions. emotions. A, product a product example of this example might be a car, that, a car that, has that, 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 that has a standard outlet and a console, console that you can plug anything into. Imagine, imagine how convenient, how convenient that, would be. that would be. If it didn't have a standard outlet, the customer would just remain neutral. You don't miss what you never knew about. A service example might be a hospital that will order a meal from a patient's favorite outside restaurant and deliver it to their room. Again, Again, if you don't, if you don't, have, don't it, have it, they're not going to be dissatisfied. A nice example of excitement quality that, that I personally experienced while on business in Scotland, Scotland was a hotel that had a free decanter of scotch in every room. room. Excitement, excitement needs, needs delight, delight the customer when they're present, they're present, but do not but do result, not result in, in any dissatisfaction when they're absent. When they're absent. An, important An important note about this model is how needs change over time. History, History has, proved has proved that what was, that what exciting, was exciting yesterday, yesterday will, be will be asked for today, for today and, expected and expected tomorrow. tomorrow. In other words, words excitement qualities will, will become performance, performance and, eventually and eventually basic. basic. Some, Some examples of this phenomenon, of this phenomenon in the U.S. market, market include, include windshield wipers, wipers on a car, on a car. Cameras, cameras integrated, integrated into cell phones, into cell phones. pay at the pay pump in a gas station, and even high-speed internet access in most hotels. The point, the point here is here to continually is to prime, prime the pump, the pump with, new with new ideas and innovations, innovations because, because most of those innovations, those innovations will differentiate your product, your product and service for only a brief period of time. To summarize, to summarize the counter model, model very eloquently, eloquently showed us what three classification of needs customers, customers have. have. That's a big, That's step, a big step, step, but not, not enough. enough. We must now we must take now the next take step to determine how to effectively gather those three categories of needs. Ultimately, Ultimately, you should end, you should up, with end up with a list of needs, needs and attributes, attributes for each for of the each three Kano categories. categories. So a key so point to remember is typical DOC, DOC research, research must be enhanced to go beyond, beyond what the customers can tell us to uncover latent, latent unarticulated, and future needs. needs. In, other words, In other words, uncover the basic needs, needs customers won't mention and the excitement the needs they don't even realize they have. We call this MOC. The mind, the mind of the customer, of the customer. and its and primary, primary role is to help us to deliver, deliver innovation, innovation. Kano's excitement, excitement quality. So that captures really well characters we have to have. What are the basic things we must do? Basic skills we must have and need to have. The performance. How well are we able to perform and do things? And we, we got what my research is also showing is that what used to be considered intermediate level skills is now basic. You're supposed to know that coming out of the gate. What would before it took years, now you need to know and need to be able to perform it in a good way. Good way. And you also have to continue to think about how do we get some unexpected ways to exceed expectations because what was at one time exciting becomes expected. So we have to continually find new ways to exceed expectations of people by learning, discovering, continually learning about um, what's what are new ways to move forward. Now Many of you know what Febreze is. Febreze, is, of course, is something that eliminates a bad smell. And I learned about this in Duhigg's Power of Habit. Procter & Gamble had, they had a new product that tested and worked, and that was great. What happened was the chemist one day came home from work, at least according to the story in Power of Habits, and his wife said, Wow, you quit smoking. And he's like, No, I didn't quit smoking. But somehow the chemical he had created ended up changing the molecular structure of the bad smell and eliminated it. So, you know, they thought this was a gold mine. It would be incredible because you get rid of really bad smells. And they thought it would create a new habit because you'd have a bad smell. Uh, people would then spray the Febreze, you know, similar to when you have a cue like to brush your teeth or you had a dandruff that they've used for years successfully. But the problem was, what was the reward? You know, how did they feel better? Because it really was, it just eliminated a bad smell. And what happened, you know, when you think about the habit, was the new ending was nothing. They didn't actually smell better, it just didn't smell bad, so it never sold. Uh, like, 
you know, the cues that they had with the little tang you feel after you brush teeth, that's to remind you whether you taught or not. See, my thoughts why this didn't work is because previously the reward was nothing. It was no bad smell. The reward didn't get anything. And really, we need something. We want something for our efforts. Now, if you spray Febreze, it's left with a better smell. It actually smells good when you're done. So, this is similar in health. We have to think about what reward are we getting for our efforts? There's got to be a gain. Prevention gives us nothing, which is good. I mean, it's not something bad, but if we don't have anything to be with, why do we do this? What was it, What do we get for it? So we got to move past problems. You know, right now we're at the status quo, and our status quo is our expectation. We assume things are going to be as they are now. So everything that happens, we compare it to that reference, which is what you have right now. Is it going to be better? And as they talk about in prospect theory, Kahneman and Tversky, it's the value of the change. Is it better or worse than what I have right now? So we're at the status quo, and then something could happen. We have a problem, and I'll call that negative three. Now, the problem could be diabetes, and then we'd say, oh, my goodness, we need to solve this problem. Or it could be you know, emissions, it could be pollution, it could be inactivity, it could be heart disease, it could be car trouble, it could be more pollution. I mean, there's things, that we don't, so we fix it. We get that fixed, and then we, well, we kind of relax. We're back to our expectation, back to our reference point. We're back to our status quo. But in essence, what that's done is it's created a ceiling. This ceiling is where we were. So is it better? Is it positive? Well, kind of. I mean, it's better than the problem we had, but really it's just not worse. Now, if humans are innately bad, if we're innately nasty, not being nasty would be great. The thing is, we are good, good beings. So zero means we just have to stay how we are. Where well, I'm hoping most of us want to be better, not just non-negative. We're working from this deficit theory when we don't really have deficits. I mean, the idea of prevention is to eliminate deficits to get us back to where we were, which is the same idea with reduce, reuse, and recycle. And you know what happened when Febreze used this to get back to zero it wasn't very effective. They need to produce something better. What we really want is improvement. We want this. We want that plus three that I talked about. We're going to be thriving. We're going to be flourishing. We're going to be achieving. We want some positive gains. Bromgarten and McDonough talk about upcycling. So when the second time we use it, it's better than it was before. So we really do create a better world. This is what Steve Jobs did at Apple. He didn't fix the problems with Apple. In 1997, remember, they were bankrupt. They actually had to borrow $150 million from, from Bill Gates just to stay afloat. But instead of fixing problems that Apple had, he said, let's just make insanely great products. Now, Apple, of course, has become part of almost everybody's life so that it's made it better. So the focus was on go growth and gain for the company, and they became what they are today. <gasps> so problem solving just wasn't enough. You've got to think about, what am I going to create? What reality are we, are we moving towards? Now, you may be thinking, what the heck does that mean? You may be thinking, what do you mean? What does that mean? What does what mean? Well, if you desire improvement, you know, a lot of us start from this negative three point. We think of stress and pains and difficulty, and how do we get rid of that? But getting rid of it just brings us back to zero. Not better, just not as bad. You know, so we're reducing those losses. We want to create that plus three. We want to go to a better place. We want to think, think what would be growth, what would be gain, gains, what would allow us to thrive and to flourish and to achieve what it is we hope our life is going to be about. How can we do that? Well, the first thing we have to do, for sure, we have to start here. We have to start at that plus three. Imagine what could be that doesn't exist now, but could be. Get excited about what it is. It's not possible to start from a problem and get to plus three. You may get there by accident, but if you start from a problem, your outcome is going to be not having a problem. Not plus three, just zero. So what that means is, we have to think about exceeding expectations and move well beyond problems because better is possible, but we have to redesign the way we think about reality. Why is that so important? You know, think about it. When do you call the neighbors and wake the kids? If you get what you expect, well, not that exciting. But when we exceed expectations, that's what we're going to tell everyone. That's that plus three that everybody's thinking about. That's thinking differently where Einstein told us we can't solve problems using the same kind of thinking we use when we created them because then we're just thinking about the same. We have to think differently. 
So we can't do the same thing over and over and expect different results. We have to think differently. It's going to be blurry. It's going to be interesting and hopeful. And it's certainly going to be useful. But you have to remember, it's always in beta. We're always thinking, how can we do this better? What's a better way to do this? So what we're talking about is new solutions, not necessarily new problems. It's got to be a new way of thinking, similar to the way Apple thought differently about what could be. Because right now in health, we're, we're getting Orwellian doublespeak. If you remember 1984, the book, they talk about war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. And this goes on in politics all the time, where they have the clear skies agenda, which actually led to more pollution. You know, and then my wife's favorite, you know, we have to spend more, spend more if we really want to save. So if there's a discount, like it's 50% off, we can buy two of them and get even more. But then if we spend nothing, of course, we save a lot more. Now, in health, you know, they say they have the well checks. But the well checks don't actually help anybody. I mean, they, they don't check for how healthy they're going to be, but rather how sick they may be or have the risks they have. And, of course, the healthcare center, you only access when you're sick, not when you're healthy. But it's very common is uh, in work sometimes, you know, if everybody's, you're there, you work hard, you're every day, you work really hard, and you're healthy and take care of yourself, well, you should come to work every day. But we'll give you a day off with pay if you get sick. It's kind of like that way we're rewarding people for getting sick. It doesn't really make any sense. And a lot of workplaces make them take health risk assessments, which are very confusing because you would think if you score high in those, you'd be at a high risk for health. But no, you're at a high risk for disease. So really, they should be illness risk assessments. Unfortunately, the assumption with health is that health means no sickness. But you know what happens when you assume things? Is you're going to make something you don't want to be out of you and me. So we have to really focus on learning. Learning is about sharing information, ideas, and challenging the interpretation people have. To rethink while you're in a climate of support. It's really a great opportunity to learn because at this time... Yeah, you can, when you're curious about something, find out, solve your doubts. Don't let it pass. You know, learn what you can. Most of us want mastery. Mastery is something you continually expand uh, to create the results you want in life. Reading is a great way to do that. Read as much as you can to learn and challenge the ideas that people are presenting in those books. These are a few good books that I've read. Um, personal mastery, of course, isn't something you get, but it's continual improvement. Because competence and ignorance are growth areas. They're not, it's not a paradox. Because journey, the journey is really the reward. This idea of extraordinary doesn't just happen. We have to cause it to happen. Now, this book, Deming Profound's Changes, I thought had some really great ideas of, about principles for learning. The idea is um, understand the provisional nature of knowledge. Understand that knowledge is never perfect. It's, we're always revising what we know and to learn something better. And know that nothing new is going to jump into your head. You're going to have to go get it. And you have to challenge what you already believe. Also, always think about how everything's connected. Think about the synergistic nature of knowledge and how it fits in with what we already know. And it's always important as you want to keep learning. You know, enjoy the challenge, tolerate ambiguity, realize there could be more than one answer because there really are no certain answers. And also understand with these limitations that you have to continually try to learn new, new things all the time so you can challenge, modify, and deepen what you already know. And to do that, you're going to consistently use higher order thinking. Examine and reflect on what you know and see, does that make sense? Is that right? You know, so you want to consistently use a scientific method to test and increase your knowledge. Now, you've heard the Confucius saying, I hear and I forget, I see, I remember, and I do and I understand. But my colleague challenged me and said, you know what? Sometimes you do things, and you, just because you did it and you got the outcome, doesn't mean you know how that happened. So really... It's only when you think about what you did that you can truly understand. I mean, review what you did. What made this successful? Why was this possible? And by doing that, you can possibly do it again. As Deming said, experience teach itself teaches nothing. Because without theory, experience has no meaning. Without a theory, no one has questions to ask. Hence, without theory, no one can learn. In other words, you need something to measure your experience against. Theory is a prediction. Did what the theory predict happen in your real life, or was it not? Compare it to what it's supposed to be and see did it make sense. That's also why we have measures. Measures create a standard. They enable us to collaborate by saying, I got this, you got that. Henry Ford told us that the standards today are necessary because they're a foundation on which we can build improvement. Without knowing what, where we are, how do we know if we've gotten better? And in Japan, they said without standards, there can be no Kaizen, which is continuous improvement. Now, 
as a student, I hope you're going to set yourself a really high standard. And all of us are students. We're all learning. And say, this is who I expect to be, and this is how I'm going to get there. So you want to create that path for improvement. Also understand that plans and procedures, they're just assumptions. So if it doesn't work out as expected, look at that and say, wow, look what I learned. Look at how I can do better next time. I also know that never try to accept things unless they're a holistic solution. Don't look for individual solutions. Think, how does this fit? How does it connect to the organizations, the community, the city, and the nation um, in which it's connected? Also, always try to be a good role model. What, no matter what we say, it won't carry any weight unless it's what we do. And you want to do this because it makes your life better. You know, making your life better is going to give you a lot more reason to want to share that with other people. Your actions will speak so loudly, people won't hear what you're saying. Also, understand the limitations of your intuitive knowledge, what your gut says. I mean, when you have years and years of experience, say it takes about 10 years um, of experience to be able to trust your gut, and that's going to keep changing because you're going to keep learning. But you want to question your gut. What's your gut instinct is going to be automatic. You may, may be far a little bit more. Now, gurus are ones that don't want to change the doctrine. Always look at people as teachers. Build on their ideas. I hope I'm a teacher, and I want people to build on this idea of positive health leadership and how they can make it even better and stronger in the future to make these ideas better for everyone. And you know, think how are we going to exceed those expectations. I'm idealistic in the idea that I believe we can create a better world, but I know that there's a difference between how things are and how they could be. I know we're going to need some new knowledge uh, and potential might be realized, but we're going to need something new. Naive is just thinking we're already there, we know everything, we just have to work harder. Well, I, that's not going to work. We've got to find a better way to get this done. So when you're thinking about this, a lot of times it's easy to come up with why this can't be done. Now, of course, hopefully you're also thinking why this could be done. But as far as I'm concerned, this is irrelevant. There's never a can't be done. I mean, Peggy Noonan said, cynicism is not realistic and tough. It's unrealistic. Really, it's kind of cowardly because it means you don't have to try. If it can't be done, why try? So I want people to think about how could this, you know, why why this can be done and how. How are we going to make that happen? It was Deming that said it was all about the process. We try to think continually improve the process so the product can take care of itself. And to make pangenesis happen, to create interactions so everyone and everything benefits, you have to start with an idealized outcome. Discover systematic precursors. What is it that comes before that outcome? What process will create those precursors? And how do we know we're making progress in the right way? So if you want to do progress, the panegenesis process can help. Now, this model was just published as of now. It's August 2017. And it was just published this week in the Art of Health Promotion. So this is the article, Going on Offense to Enable Health Promotion Gains, was published, and you can access it at these sites if you want to learn more. And I'll give you a little video about, how, about this model for how we can use the pangenesis model. And you know pangenesis is generating all good by creating interactions so everyone and everything benefits. you got to start by thinking, what could be? What's this idealized outcome that, that could be? What has to come before those idealized outcomes? What precursors must exist? And then how do we, what process must we engage in to make those, to make that a reality? I understand the pro planning for order is going to be backwards. Start from the outcome. And work back to what you have to do. You start with the outcome that would exceed expectations. And you want to think, how do we, how do we make the community better, the society better, how do we have a better public image, retention and recruitment, being a model, purpose, I mean, all these types of things. Now, the byproduct or a secondary outcome is going to be increased profitability. Money's going to follow. It's not going to lead. One of the precursors you're going to have to have to get those idealized outcomes is you're going to need a supportive culture and trust and ownership. People have to feel like this is some, this is their thing. At a workplace, you want to have a, a fulfilling job. Some are socially feel connected. They have a helpful environment. Got to have well-being. Got to feel like they're building intellectual, intellectuality. They have beneficial emotions, they're connected spiritually, and they're really helping themselves be strong. And your process must be driven by quality management methods. Some specific ideas include business skills, program coordination skills, and human resource skills for health professionals. And these other skills include technology, budget, policies, communication, planning, and of course, there's assessment, design, implementation, and evaluation. 
and also staffing, professional development, all those things are part of your process to create those precursors that can lead to those expectations. Now in reality, in real time, it's going to go from the process to the precursors to the outcome, but you have to plan backwards. Now to know you're on the right path, continually plot your progress. Discover, make sure that what you're doing is leading to where you want to go. If not, you adjust your, you know, based on those measures, you can adjust your process to get the results you want. Now the value of adding a positive is that as you continually improve your health, prevention will take care of itself. That nothing stuff won't happen. You'll actually be going to a higher level. Now, a lot of this, of course, seems like obvious common sense. And you may wonder, why do we need to make this change? We're really very close already. Um, it's a strategy to how to use common sense. Salute to Genesis, if you follow me in other areas, is about the origins of health. Well, what about this method? Take a few seconds, and I want you to try to find 1 through 50 in these random numbers. Okay, I'm guessing some of you got to six or seven or eight. But if we put a method to this, like in this one, where you start in the upper corner, you start there and you go counterclockwise, now take a few seconds and see if you can find numbers. Well, I hope with, your, with this method, you probably were able to do a lot better. And that's what's true with health and really with life. Because if you, you need a method, if you didn't need a method, your goal would have already been achieved, as Dr. Deming talked about. Well, hope this gets you on the right, right page and you're ready to go so we can have a great semester. And if you want, you can access this, a copy of this lecture here. Take care. Thank you.